Um, Nigel, I, I actually met Nigel. He probably doesn't remember meeting me, but I remember Nigel and Sandy Lydiard. I, I really met them probably close to eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. They were leading worship at the House of Prayer before they moved up where they're at now on Garfield and South Airport downtown. And I remember I walked in for a prayer time and I thought, boy, these people know how to worship and they are in the throne room of heaven. And it just touched me. And I never knew them, but over the years, you know, Nigel and I in particular, we've seen each other passing away. I've been a, had a friendship with Morgan Mitchell for quite some time. And so it'd be, hey, how's it going? You know, we'd shake hands and it'd be the politeness and all that stuff, but never knew them. And well, uh, there's a couple that's coming to our church, uh, Terry and, and Sherry Alps, and they said, hey, Alps, sorry, Alps, if you're still here, sorry, guys, but Alps, you try to get through help and worship, all these announcements and this, so see how good, anyway, Terry and Sherry Alps, hey, last week, I'm not kidding you, I put Joseph in the burning bush all the time, I mean, it's, it, it happens, but it, it doesn't change God's message, but... <laughs> I did. I did last week. I put, it was instead of David and Bathsheba, it was some David and somebody else. I don't know what it was, but it, anyway, okay. I digress. And so they said, hey, do you know, you know Nigel? I said, yeah, I know him. They said, you need to have him preach. They're getting ready to move to Israel. And, and boy, I, I said, oh. I said, well, I don't ever have anyone preach unless I know him. So they said, well, we'll have dinner. So we had dinner, and it was an instant connection. I mean, him and Sandy, I'll tell you what, you guys are going to love them. They are just such a heart for God. 20 years ago, uh, I mean, their life's been incredible. But 20 years ago, they started a house of prayer in Jerusalem. And now their daughter is actually overseeing some of that. But they have 24 hours a day, seven days a week prayer in Jerusalem. And it is phenomenal. They are heading back there. God told them to put their house up for sale. So if you know anybody that's looking for a house, yeah. see them today. Yeah. So they're selling their house. They're moving back to Israel. And God has done so many. I mean, they have story upon story upon story. And, and, and I mean, God has used them. And we believe when we got together that night, I know they already knew this. But I believe God just used us to confirm it, that uh, God has used them in introducing people uh, uh, giving a, a prophetic dream interpretation, whatever the case may be, a word of wisdom, word of knowledge about something, people who are world shakers, I mean, people in governments who then go on and do something, who are born-again Christians, and because of... Uh, some of the words that have been spoken, God does some incredible things. And I believe that there is coming a time more than ever that with these two as well as others, but both, both Sandy and Nigel, I believe you're, you're going to be watching the news and none of us will know and, you, and something will happen that will be just, just uh, earth shattering and you'll be like, yeah, we spoke a word to that guy. And, and here's the thing, they don't want the glory. And so God is using them in a way that they can get into these situations where they can speak into world leaders like that. And we are just thrilled. We're going to start partnering with them and supporting their ministry. We're going to take an offering later. I'll tell you more about that and give you an opportunity to partner with them. But I know you're going to love it this morning. We're going to have, uh, Sandy's going to come up and take the mic. I know that. No, it's, but they, they've got a great message. Come on up, you guys. Nigel, Sandy, would you guys welcome them this morning? If you want to use that, would that be all right? You guys can share that, then I'll just keep this. Yeah, yeah. You can you can mute me, Josh. Mute the pastor. Mute the pastor. I don't think so. Well, thank you for having us. We're really excited. This is a kind of a dream come true. Um, Nigel usually does all the teaching and all the preaching and everything, and then. Um, I saw, I was saying, I saw a, a YouTube video, you know, of a, of a couple that were pastoring, and they sat up the front together, you know, they were on two things, and, and so I said, Nigel, this is the new way for us, I mean, the two of us up here together, but then Nigel wasn't so sure about it, and then, and then, and then, and then we had this dinner um, with, oh, it was so wonderful with, with uh, Pastor Tony and Trish, and then they said, we want both of you to come up and see her. I thought, ooh, ooh wow, <laughs> word of the Lord. And so, so, so then, so then we, then, then, then Pastor, this morning he said, you guys want to have two mics up there and beep? And then I thought, there's no way, I think Nigel does know that if, if, if I've got the mic, there's no chance he's going to have a word in. So, he's given ladies first, ladies first. I get to say something. <laughs> Look at that, dude, that dutiful husband, you know. Get in your place, man. 
Isn't that what they usually, isn't that what they usually say? The woman usually has to hear that, get in your place, lady. Anyway, well, well, oh, I just love, I love God's people so much, you know, and to be in his house and to worship him. Oh, I was just so blessed by the worship time. My goodness, my goodness. But anyway, I better stick to it because I, Nigel's got to share and he's got a word to, to bring. And I just want to bring a little bit to, to the table, to this table, the feasting table. But when we met the other night for the dinner, the, you know, we shared our, our stories. You know, how did you meet your husband? You know, they, we shared ours. They, they shared theirs. And it was wonderful because uh, I got to say something about this, uh, you know, how we met, because Nigel had to eat his food. You know, if you put food in front of a man, you know, what do they say? The way to the man's heart is through his, dinner, for his food. You know, so that gave me an opportunity to be able to say something, too. So I think that's how I got up here today, because they, they didn't, just have, didn't just hear Nigel. It's, yeah, it's all your fault. It's all. <laughs> anyway, I started telling our story. I loved it because it's such a God story. And um, anyway, but I'm not going to have time to tell you the whole story today, but I just want to share little bits of it. Um, we met, Nigel and I met in England, and he had gone away on a missions trip to India while he was away. I read this book in England, 1986 it was published, and that was the year we met. It's called God is a Matchmaker by Derek Prince, Derek and Ruth Prince. And... And uh, I re read this book, and, and I got up, and there was a testimony time in the church. They said, anybody got a testimony? And I, I was more outgoing and gregarious than, than, now, then, than I am now because Nigel's from England. He toned me down a little bit because he's, you know, English people are, you know, <laughs> kind of reserved and stuff. You know, so anyway, um, I get up there, and I had just met Nigel, and I just read this book. And God is a matchmaker. Oh, I recommend it to all you young people. And, 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 and anyway, you can check it out from the library. And, it's, and you know what the library copy? It's a little black book. You know the little black book? You know, anyway. Anyway, but anyway, that joke went maybe nowhere. But um, anyway, anyway, the copy I got was a little black book. It wasn't the one that I checked, you know, read 86 years ago. I mean, in 1986. But um, so anyway, I get up. I get up and I say, God is a matchmaker, you know, and everybody in the congregation, the British, you know, stoic people, you know, they're just cracking up this Americans getting up and saying, God is a matchmaker, and blah, blah, I go into my story of how I, you know, a little bit, just a little bit how I met Nigel. But when we were at the dinner, Tony, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he brought a whole new uh, revelation to this. You know, over the years, people have been talking to us about, you guys need to teach on marriage. You know, you need to teach on marriage. And I always said, nah, nah. What have we got to say about marriage, even though we've been married almost how many years now? But what? 32, coming up for 33. But um, so anyway, uh, he, Tony says to me, he says, when I said, I told him that part of our story, that God is a matchmaker. He said, God is a matchmaker. You know, from, from the beginning of time, Genesis, all the way to Revelation, God is a matchmaker. He's been pairing, he's been wooing, he's been preparing a bride for his son. And, and I'm thinking of this book, you know, just God is a matchmaker. For me, well, that's true too. But the broader picture that God is a matchmaker, and we are his bride, and these end time messages that Nigel and I are, are being uh, called to speak about the end time message, the gospel being preached to all nations, and then the end shall come. The restoration of Israel to their land and to their God, this three-ply, the three-ply cord. I'm just getting something else here. And the preparation of the bride. And so now, you know, we are going to start. I'm just getting revelation. This whole week I've been studying, studying, studying about what God wants to really be speaking to his bride in these last days and how we need to be ready and how we need to be eagerly. He says, it says in the word that he's going to come back for people that are eagerly waiting and crying out for his return. I'm going to go come back to that in a minute, but I just want to share something else that God spoke to me this week through... Something that he spoke in 1980, had me do in 1984. Anybody born before in 1984 in here? Oh, just, a, well, oh, yes, there are a few here today. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, uh, the, but, uh, um, anyway, in 1984, 
God spoke to me and said, I want you to write down your wants and needs in a mate. Well, I was set, you know, I, was, I met Nigel older in life, and I was set on being, a, you know, I was so sold out. I loved Jesus with all my heart, soul, and strength. And I was on the mission field, and I just had, I thought, well, Lord, you're going to have to bring somebody, you know, that meets this. But anyway, here's what I had on my, here's what, I'm not going to share every point, but here's some of them. I'm going to start with the wants. Okay, number one, I wanted a man with a creative mind. Number two, ladies, a man. <laughs> and I say move over, LLJ, cool J, because look at this man. Anyway, tall and slim. Nigel? <laughs> He's lost, lost, lost quite a bit of weight lately. And I have heels on today, but otherwise he's, he is tall and slim, you know. Okay, number, next one. Strong. Muscle man and move over. What's his name? Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> now, I must tell you, before, earlier, pastor grabs my, my notes, you know, and I thought, who comes to a service with notes with LLJ Cool J, LL Cool J, and Dwayne the Rock Johnson and somebody else coming up next. Anyway, okay, next one. Athletic. Captain of the swim team. Springboard diver. Here we go. Still can't beat me at tennis, right? No. <laughs> Actually, he probably can, but... Okay. Loves his creation. Nature, and especially the sea. Ooh, yes. Adventuresome. Big, big in the kingdom. Adventuresome. Risk taker. Ooh, yes. Good looking. Move over, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I, 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 you know, I'm not used to doing speaking and said to do a second service. You think, what are you going to, anyway, you need the anointing, you know, you need the anointing, you know, for anyway. To, and then I thought, I just thought when I was sitting there, I was thinking, what about these night talk shows? They don't do it two times, you know? Anyway, <laughs> but anyhow, um, okay. Um, I'm digressing very, very much, but okay. Oh yeah. I was going to tell you, I went to see uh, The Greatest Showman. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and you know, we, we know a woman in, in Jerusalem, she speaks to God's people from the lyrics of all the songs in that musical. And that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. I went to that musical here, uh, first time through, and thought, oh my goodness. And then I remember, you know, listened to the soundtrack at home and said, Nigel, you got to get back. You got to get back to this. By then I had the songs, you know, in, in my heart. And um, so then Nigel came, and I tell you, I wept. I mean, sobbing. I had to go like this because I thought I was going to make a big heave, you know, how you do. And, and, and not, you know, not like that, but, you know, um, but like, you know how when you're crying, you know, you go, you know, that kind of heave. And so, um, so anyhow, I took him back and I wept through the entire musical. It was just, God would speak through a donkey, it would speak through, you know, he was longing to speak to us. Anyhow. Okay. So, oh, I, the point of that is Hugh Jackman. Huey baby, hubba hubba. We call him my sister and I call him hubba hubba Huey. And so we, well, I came back from Jerusalem just in time to go down to Detroit to see hubba hubba Huey Jackman in the, uh, in the, you know, oh my goodness, it was amazing. But never mind, I got Nigel. So let me tell you, let me tell you, that was the, some of the wants. I want to tell you the needs here that uh, I had. Number one, he must love Jesus with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Number two, burning desire to be a missionary. I updated that later to say, or already a missionary. Number three, a love for me that is unconditional and biblical as Jesus loves his bride. Ooh, think about that. Willing to give his life for his bride. 
Number four, strong spiritual zeal. Number five, a man led by the spirit. Six, the spiritual head of the house. Seven, a man riding on the crest of the Holy Spirit's outpouring. His wave, the wave of his movement. Eight, a gentle, quiet, compassionate spirit. Nine, a man after God's heart. Number 10, his character, big H, and his power, his big H, operative in little h life. Number 11, bold for God. And number 12, a man of prayer. Now, when I met Nigel, I didn't get out the list and say, oh my goodness, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, you know. But then year, years later, I found it, and I thought, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. How's he going to do that? In two ways. He'll first implant in your heart those desires that correspond to his highest will for your life. He'll put them in there. And number two, then he, he will guide you to their fulfillment. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, I just want to share those because I've been wanting to share those for a long, long time. Every time we have two daughters, and every time I have an opportunity, which isn't very often, to share the, li you know, the list, the girls say, oh, no, the list. Anyway, but I, I, got, I, I really feel like God's called us now to be really be pouring into next generations. And so I want to just, for those of you that are younger than me, and, and, and I wanted this to be an inspiration to you, an encouragement to you, to set your sets, set your, your, what is it? Your sight, your goals high. Your goal's high. What does he want for you? And those of us uh, older in life, this message isn't just for the young. It's because this message that God's speaking is for his bride, his bride, his bride. I, God spoke to me as I'm looking at, looking at this and preparing this week, and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, what if God the Father had said to Jesus the Son, what are your wants? What are your needs? In a bride. In a bride. And that's my, that's my quest now. Pastor Tony Fisher set me on a new quest that I've got to be bringing this word to, to the body, to be ready, to be ready. I've been doing some wonderful study about this. Uh, i got a little longer time, so I can say a few more things, can't I? <laughs> because we don't have to leave. First service is way too short. I feel sorry for those people that come <laughs> because it's too short. <laughs> But anyway, not really, but because um, uh, <laughs> they're here, they're here. But uh, anyway, Revelation 19, and I heard the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife, his bride has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I've been listening to Derek Prince teach on this this week. He's saying that we're, 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 getting, we're preparing our, our, our gown. Well, we're going to stand before him arrayed in fine linen. And these threads are all the righteous acts, this beautiful thing you're doing for the community and how you're reaching out. All these fine threads you're weaving into the gown that you're going to stand and wear at this wedding feast that's coming. It's coming. He is coming. And Derek Prince says the funniest thing. He said, he said uh, I'm not saying this, but Derek Prince said it. He said, now some of you, I think your fine linen is just a bikini. 
You don't want to be turning up to the wedding feast in a bikini. I mean, and I thought, he, I thought he said, well, who does? But maybe some people these days do, you know, with all these wacko things. But anyway, but you know a bride usually, I mean, she's got, she's got her gown, you know, picked out and been searched out and hunted for just to find. I remember when I found, looking for mine, you know, we had to have just the right, the most stunning thing. And this is us too. We're preparing what we're going to stand before at this marriage feast. I've got to tell you just one last story, and then I'm going to let the man, the rock, stand up here and tell you. <laughs> He's slinking under his chair. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> this, this, this waiting eagerly, I'm just going to share one story of how God spoke to me recently in Jerusalem. We, we, we lived in Jerusalem eight years uh, total now. We've just been back out of the country for eight months, and God's taking us to other nations now, Israel and South Africa. And we've been come, then we come back to America because we want to get our house and everything in order here to sell it and go and go. Nigel's always saying, we've got one life, one life, one life to live. One life. That's all we've been given, you know, a few short years. And we got to make them, we got to make them count. Anyway, so it's all different for each of us, but, you know, uh, it's, it's urgent. But so anyway, we're in Jerusalem, and I, we go down to the, to the uh, old city, to the, right near the Temple Mount, where our friends John and Una used to live. And they weren't in the land anymore. They, they've had, it's hard to get into Israel with visas and things. And they've had health issues and different things. And I went to their, their home. It's still there. And just people are, other people, believers, are renting it. They live right in the city of David, right where the God's temple, uh, God's tabernacle uh, used, to, used to stand. And that was the vision that we went to help uh, fulfill or to help pioneer back in the 99, 2000, that we would have a house of prayer going 24-7 that was within walking distance of where King David would have had his original tabernacle that was going 24-7. And so, anyway, I went down to their house, and I put my hand on the gate. And I said, oh, Lord, I miss them so much. Please, can you bring John and Nuna back? Please take away, they can come back. Go back. Next day, we're leading worship in the house of prayer. Wish we got to get you to come. I'm hoping, Pastor... Tony and Trish are going to lead a group to come over. And there we're sitting. I mean, we've got the most spectacular views, place to be sitting and, and crying out for his return and for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. Floor to ceiling windows, looking over the old city, looking over the Temple Mount, looking over the Mount of Olives, where he's going to set his feet. Anyway, I'm in there. We're leading the worship. And, and before we start, I'm thinking, oh, Lord. Oh, I really, I just want John and Una to be here in the room with us, you know. And, and they bring such a riches. Please, would you bring them back? I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit say and about his son. Or Jesus speaking to me, however you want to say it. What about me? What about me? Do you have that, do you have that longing, that earnest cry? You know, I'm yearning for my friends to come back. Who's my best friend? Am I yearning? Am I sitting there? And is this, is this message in burning in my heart that I'm yearning to see his return? So, anyway, this is what we feel we have to carry now, this theme of all the people that have said to us, you need to be speaking about marriage. And, and they're exactly right. And Tony and Trish are the instruments God used to finally get me to get it. As Nigel says in his British way, the penny finally dropped. <laughs> is, that a, is that a British thing? <laughs> anyway, so praise the Lord and thank you so much for having us come. <laughs> thank you. Move over, Hugh Jackman. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hmm. I love the presence of Jesus. As I mentioned in the first service, there are two things that struck me since I came in here first thing this morning. 
And the first thing is the presence of the Lord is here. And there are, there are places that God likes to hang out. You know, God has favorite places. And this is one of them. And I feel his presence and I enjoy his presence. Hallelujah. The second thing is that the Lord showed me something in the spirit and I can still see it. That there's a river that just flows right through. Right here. There's a river that the Lord supplies. And I want to read just a few verses out of where that river comes from. It's in Revelation 22. Then he showed me, verse 1 of Revelation 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. I was just struck by that particularly. There will no longer be any curse. And that the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in in the river. If you're in the river, that's where the throne of God and of the Lamb is. And there's no curse there. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your river of life. You know, when you devote yourself to hosting the presence of the Lord, (laughs) He wants to hang out with us. It's His delight to hang out with us. In fact, if the truth be told, it is the reason we exist is to hang out with the creator of the universe. That's why he made us. That's why we exist, is to know him and to be in his presence. And his presence is here. And the river is here. Holy one. Boy, I can just close my eyes and just kind of float around in the river. I don't want especially to just sit on the bank. I like to swim, so I just, I want to get right in there. (laughs) Hallelujah. Okay, okay. I, I do want to get back to this theme of um, the bride and the gr- bridegroom and Jesus, our bridegroom king. But I want to lay a, a, a foundation quickly before we get back to that in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15 is a time um, when Abram, he's later renamed by God Abraham, But before he's renamed, God has an encounter with him. In fact, it's not the first encounter that that Abram has had with the Lord. You can go back to um, Genesis 12 for that first encounter where the Lord speaks to him to come out of Ur of the Chaldeans. But this is another encounter that he has with the Lord, a major encounter. And the Lord blesses him, promises promises to bless Abram greatly. And Abram's response is, yeah, but I don't have any children, so... That blessing is not going to get passed on to the next generation of my family because I don't have one. Um, It'll get passed on to Eliezer of Damascus. It's going to get passed on to my servant's children. And God said, no, come outside a minute. Now look up. And it's nighttime, and, this, and he shows him the stars of the heavens. You know, um, if, you, if you Google it, you'll find out that there's about 10,000 stars that are visible to the naked eye. Um, and God says to Ab- Abram, count the stars if you're able. <laughs> Your descendants are going to be more numerous than that. And Abram immediately believes him, and God credits that belief as faith and, and, and credits, it, credits it to him as righteousness. Yes. Because he believes. And by the way, that's the basis on which we receive righteousness too. Is by faith in God and his supply in Jesus Christ. So, then God says, having, having established that, that Abram's going to have his own descendants, his own family, his own posterity. 
And it's interesting to me, he's not just thinking about himself. He's thinking about the generations that follow. That's so important. When, when God, offered, God said he was going to bless him, his first thought is, what about the next generations? What about the, the family that follows? Um, but having established that God is going to give him a family, a posterity that's going to be enormous, he then says, and I'm going to give to your descendants all of this land, all of the land that you have walked in. It's all going to be theirs. And he says this to the Lord, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? What an interesting question. How may I know that I will possess it? We already know he's not in unbelief. He totally believes what God is saying. But he's asking for something from God to, to establish. How is he going to know? Um, God's answer to that question, in my view, is one of the most important answers to prayer in the entire Bible. Because it establishes and identifies the basis on which God relates to mankind. And it is always on the basis of covenant. Now we relate to God in, in different ways. We relate to Him as a father. We relate to Him as a friend. We relate to Him as a savior, as a deliverer, as a king. Different ways that we relate to Him as the bridegroom. But all of that, underneath all of that is the foundation that God relates to man on the basis of covenant. Always covenant. Because covenant is the strongest bond of relationship between two people. There is no stronger bond of relationship than covenant. And so God's answer to the question, how may I know that I will possess what you promise? God's answer is that they enter into a covenant relationship. You have to read on through the rest of the chapter to see it, but I'll just um, read from verse 17. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. That's the sacrifice that was laid out. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. By the way, that is much a much larger piece of land than we currently refer to as Israel. Um, but that's, that's discussions for another day. But that's a much bigger piece of land. Um, oh, I don't have time to get into any of that. So God's answer to the question, how may I know that, that you're going to fulfill these promises? How may I know that this is going to happen? God's answer is to enter into a covenant relationship. God could have done any kind of sign or wonder to confirm that what he was saying was true. But those things would have passed. But he enters into an eternal covenant relationship with Abram. And you go to Genesis 17, two chapters later on, and God gives more detail to what that covenant looks like. But he, three times in Genesis 17, God identifies it as everlasting an everlasting covenant. That means it's not for a long time. It means forever. It's eternal. It cannot be undone. And this is the relationship that God has. Well, we know that Abraham's son, Isaac, and God met Isaac and reaffirmed his covenant to Isaac and to his descendants. And then Isaac had a son, Jacob, whom he, God renamed Israel. And God affirmed to him the covenant relationship forever to all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom he renamed Israel. So all of the descendants of Israel, all of Israel, God has entered into a covenant relationship with them forever. You know, there's some interesting things about covenant. It can't be undone. When you enter into covenant, it is, it, is, it is forever. The closest thing we have to the picture of covenant is marriage. Marriage, uh, biblically, marriage is a covenant relationship. It is a commitment that cannot be broken. Part of our vows, when Sandy and I were married, one of the things that I declared was, till death do us part. 
Why? That's the language of covenant. That's saying, only death, death is the only thing that's going to stop me continuing to fulfill this commitment. Hmm. That is the nature of the commitment that God has toward us. When we gave our lives to Jesus, whether we knew it or not, we were entering into a, this covenant relationship that as far as God is concerned, cannot be broken. It cannot. Now you can, if you look at the life of Israel, you understand that a lot of the time they kind of drifted well away from God. They turned their backs on Him. They entered into sin and all kinds of, all kinds of nonsense. And yet the covenant was never damaged. The covenant remains intact. But now... When, when sin enters into the picture, when violations of the covenant occur, the issue is not that the covenant is broken. The issue is now the consequences of violating the covenant come into play. And so they receive God's judgment, which is part of the covenant. Yeah, that's right. Motivated by love, motivated by God's mercy, and also motivated by God's righteousness and justice. But the covenant remains intact. But now the judgments are in play. And then they come back to the Lord. They repent and God receives them back. And they get blessed again. And they enjoy His blessings while they're walking with Him. It's the same for us. Uh, we walk in covenant relationship with Jesus. If we violate the terms of the covenant, the covenant is still intact. But now we have to, we, get, we receive God's judgment. And it's, an, it's something that we have to understand that God who... God, who is the judge, His judgments are good. Why? Because the, the goal of His judgment is to get us back. <laughs> get us back into relationship with Him. Okay, you know, something about a covenant. When two people enter into a covenant relationship, when I entered into a covenant relationship with Sandy, everything that I own is now belongs to her. She has access to and everything that she has, I have access to, right? It's a total commitment. And um, on that thought, just think about that with regard to our covenant relationship with God. Everything that I have now belongs to God, which is practically nothing. And everything that He has, which is everything... Is now made available to me. That's why Jesus was able to say, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will do it for you. But this is because of covenant. Because when, when I ask my covenant partner for something, the response should always be yes. And when my covenant partner asks something of me, my response should always be yes. To say no is a violation of covenant. We don't want to do that. So we want to respond positively when our covenant partner asks something of us. When God asks something of us, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Um, you know, I was in Jerusalem one time and I was praying at night, late at night. I like to go out and walk the streets late at night. And I was out walking and I, I said, Lord, can you give me a fresh understanding of your love for me? And uh, I really just need to get a fresh revelation of your love. And a few days later, we were leading, leading a meeting in the house of prayer. And, and one of the things we did in the house of prayer quite a bit when we led was to, have, was to take communion. And so we're handing out the communion elements. And I'm talking about covenant. You see, the, the communion is the rehearsal of this covenant relationship. It, it, is, it is a constant repetition, a, a reminder of what covenant looks like, the total commitment. But, but I'll get back to that in just a minute. So we ha handed out the elements. And I'm, making, I'm talking about this total commitment both sides. And I made this statement, you know, everything that I have belongs to God. Everything God has belongs to me. And I made this comment. I said, you know, just thinking about that, everything I have belongs to God. Yeah, whatever. And everything that God has is now made available to me. And I said, it seems like we get the better part of this deal. <laughs> So I made this statement, and the Holy Spirit stopped me right there, and he said, No, Nigel, you don't understand. I get the better part of this deal. 
because I get you. I hope you can receive that. The declaration of God is that the, all of the resources of heaven are not as valuable to God as you are to Him. He gets the better part of the deal because He gets us in relationship. And that is the desire of His heart. Wow, that blew me away. <laughs> that blew me away. Okay. <sighs> I'll paint the Jewish picture. We've got to do that now. So, consistently through the scriptures, God uses the picture of marriage as a, a, to identify his relationship with Israel. He speaks of Israel like a bride and himself as like a bridegroom. Remember the prophet Hosea, what he had to go through? had to marry a prostitute to demonstrate how God's love for Israel, even when Israel was unfaithful like a prostitute. Um, so that identity flows through Scripture and into the New Testament. And when Jesus met with the disciples for the Last Supper, the night that he was going to be betrayed and ultimately hang on the cross the following day, the language of that meeting, what took place in that meeting at the Last Supper was all about betrothal. It was all about a covenant relationship, specifically referring to betrothal. Now, what is betrothal? Betrothal is a little bit like engagement when you get engaged to be married. Betrothal is like the, the, the commitment of, a, of the bride and the bridegroom together. It's not the marriage. It's not the wedding yet but it is the beginning of covenant. It's the entering into a covenant relationship. So let me give you this picture quickly. 2,000 years ago, in the, in the, when Jesus was walking on the earth, in the culture of the Jewish people, you know this entire Bible is written in the context of Jewish culture. And the more we understand Jewish culture, the more we will understand the Scriptures. So in the, in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, when a young man desired to be married to a young lady, he would approach the father of the young lady and express his desire to marry his daughter. And the father, presumably ready for this day, probably waiting a lot, anticipating this day would come, he says to the young man, well, how much have you got? My daughter is really valuable. He's not trying to sell his daughter, but what he's trying to do is evoke from this young man an understanding of the value of the relationship he's going to enter into. And so, hopefully the young man would be prepared for this. Hopefully. And he'd reach into his pocket and pull out his list. Well, I've got, you know, five sacks of, 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 of wheat and uh, three sacks of barley and, uh, and a goat. And uh, the father would just kind of shake his head, no, 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 that's, that's not enough. You're going to have to do better. But if the father was willing for this marriage to take place, they would negotiate what is called a bride price. Um, and it's sort of, like a, sort of like a dowry. But anyway, it's a bride price. It's the price that the, 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 the groom brings to... Uh, for the bride. And um, so once they, once they have agreed on a bride price, the father will host a banquet for the whole family and friends, and they all gather together, and they have a lot of great food. And at a certain point in the evening, the father will stand up, and he will make this announcement, this young man has made a proposal of marriage to my daughter. And while he's making this announcement, the young, the young man will take a cup, and he will fill it with wine, until it's overflowing. And he'll take the cup and he places it in front of the young lady. And she is going to indicate her acceptance of this proposal by picking up the cup and drinking some of the wine in it. Not all of it, but some of it. So every eye is on her. Is she going to be married? Does she like this guy? Is it going to work out? And you know... 
as would happen, she'd kind of pick up the cup and look around and put it back down and everyone would go, oh, what's going on? But if she was willing to be married, she would drink some of the wine. And as soon as the wine touches her lips, they are betrothed. That is the moment at which the marriage covenant begins. That commitment begins there. It's not the wedding yet. The wedding comes later. But the marriage covenant begins there. The commitment. So... As soon as, as soon as she drinks that wine, a veil, they, she'll be attended to. A veil is placed over her face because she is not to look upon another man and no other man is to look upon her. She is committed. She is now in covenant. Again, it's not the wedding yet, but the covenant relationship has begun. Okay, so I hope you're catching this. Jesus, Jesus. We can't look on anyone else. Jesus, Jesus. Okay, so there are a couple of things that have to happen before the end of this evening. One of the things that happens is that the young man is going to leave. And before he leaves, we'll call him the bridegroom. Before the bridegroom leaves... One of the things that happens is that the young lady will drink the remainder of the wine in the cup. And this is called the drink of remembrance. Very specifically, this is the drink of remembrance. What is she remembering? She's remembering two things. She is remembering, I am now in covenant with this man, but he has to go away. But I remember that I'm in covenant. I remember that he has promised To return to me. So she will drink the remainder of the wine and cup. The drink of remembrance. That's why Jesus said these words. um, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after, after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. Jesus is making very specifically a reference to the cup of remembrance to the disciples at the Last Supper. Saying, this is, remember, we are now, what is he saying to them? He's saying, we're now in covenant. It's not the wedding yet, but we are now in covenant. And I've got to go away. But if I go away, I'll come back to you and we'll be together forever. So what happens now is having drunk the cup of Remembrance, now the, now the bridegroom heads out. Where's he going? He's going to his father's house, Whoa. to his father's property, and he's going to build on the side of his father's house a home for his new bride and for his family to be. Just as it is written, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And behold, I go to prepare a place for you. This is the bridegroom Jesus speaking. So he goes and he's going to work on this property. But something else happens. Once he gets to his father's house, his father will send either a family member or a trusted servant back to the bride to teach the bride everything about the groom. You know, when Jesus spoke to the disciples and he said, I know that you're sad because you've heard that I've got to leave, but I do have to leave. But if I go... I will send to you a comforter. I will send to you one just like me. And he will instruct you in all things. And remind you and bring to your remembrance everything that I've told you. And so it is. From the the Father's house, when the bridegroom goes to the Father's house, the Father sends the Holy Spirit to prepare the bride to, to receive the groom. So that the bride will be ready. How we need the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the bridegroom's going to be gone. His construction project may take him a few months. It's usually anywhere between six months and two years, but usually about a year this construction project takes place. But as excited as he is to get the job done and go, go see his bride, go be united with his bride, he can't make the decision to go. His father will then come and inspect his work. 
and make sure that everything is done right, everything is complete, everything is in order. And only when the Father decides that everything is in order, then the Father says, okay, son, now go receive your bride. That's why it is written, um, it's in Matthew 24, no, oh, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. When Jesus, Jesus was being asked about when he was coming into his kingdom, that was part of his response, Matthew 24. No one knows the day or the hour. Not even the angels, not even the Son, only the Father, because it's the Father's decision alone when everything is all, everything is lined up, everything is in order. So when the Father does say, yes, everything can be done, everything's done now, you can go receive your bride, you know he's not going to be hanging about. You know, he's going to have his camels packed for a couple of months, he's going to be ready to go. So he's going to take off, and even if he arrives in the middle of the night, so be it, he's not... He's not stopping at motels along the way. You know, he's, if he gets there in the middle of the night, that's okay. Which is why we read of the, you know, the, in Matthew 25 about the ten virgins. If he arrives in the middle of the night, huh, you've got to be ready. You've got to be prepared. So when he does arrive, he's going to go find his bride. And what happens? Oh, by the way. In the story of the ten virgins, you know they have lamps? <laughs> the lamps were not for, the, for them to see where they're going. The lamps are for the bridegroom to see where to come to. I hope you get that. That's why our lamps have got to be burning. Because Jesus is coming to the ones with the lamps. You get it? Okay, so when he arrives, he gets to his bride. And his bride... It's got a very special document in her hands. So let me talk about that just a minute, because this is the other thing that has to happen at that betrothal ceremony. We'll go back to that quickly. Before the bridegroom leaves, he signs a document. It's a very important document. It's called a ketubah. <laughs> a ketubah is a, a scroll. It's written on the front, and it's written on the back, and it contains the... Family history on both sides, the bride's side and the groom's side. It contains all of the covenant promises that the bridegroom makes to his bride. And it also contains the consequences of violating those covenant, that covenant commitment. And it also contains the bride price. And so, <coughs> excuse me, so seven, there are seven signatures on the ketubah. By the way, you can go to ketubah.com today and, and buy a ketubah if you want. They, they're still used in, cert, in Jewish ceremonies, betrothal ceremonies. But usually the modern ones have three or five signatures. In Jesus' day, there would have been seven. The bride, the groom, the bride's father, the groom's father, the rabbi or scribe, and then two witnesses. Makes seven. Um, and so... So all of those folks sign the ketubah before the groom leaves. And now when the groom comes back to receive his bride, the bride will have the ketubah. This is the most precious document because this, is, this contains the promise, all the promises of, his, of her bridegroom. And when he comes to her, he will take the scroll out of her hands and open it up and then read over her, declare over her, all of his covenant promises to her. And if you want to know what's written in there, we've got a copy. All the family history, all of the covenant promises, and all the consequences, and the bride price. It's all in here. One of the things that's interesting about the ketubah is that 2,000 years ago, they didn't use ballpoint pens. In fact, most people didn't write. And so their signature, they wouldn't, have had, they wouldn't have signed with a pen. They would have signed with a seal. They would have a, like clay or wax would be put on the, put on the, on the paper. 
And then they would have a signet from where we get the word signature. They would have a signet either carved into a ring or into a pendant. And then that signet was pressed into the wax or into the clay. And it made a mark. That impression was your signature. That was your, the, the validity of your, the authenticity of your approval, if you will. And so the ketubah, the scroll that's written in the front and the back, would have had not had seven signatures exactly. It would have had seven seals. Are you catching on? Revelation 5. I love Revelation 4 and 5. It's one of my favorite, one of my most favorite portions of Scripture. It's like a, uh, it's like a progression of the revelation of the Godhead from the beginning of Revelation 4 until the end of Revelation 5. So what happens in Revelation 5? I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book. Well, actually, the word is book in my Bible, but it's actually the word for scroll. So let me read it to you that way, if I can put it there. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back and sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Why is John so upset? He knows what it is. And he understands that the only one who has the authority to open this, open this scroll, open this ketubah, is the bridegroom. But why is no one found worthy? Surely Jesus is found worthy. Well, here. One of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, so as to open the scroll and... It's seven seals. I want to say something. Why was nobody found worthy? And if, if you can bear with me for a moment, this isn't heresy. But for, for a time, not even Jesus was worthy to open that scroll. Because he hadn't yet paid the bride price. And so what are they declaring here? Now he's worthy. What do they sing? Go down to verse 9. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God. Right price. Purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. He had paid the bride price. That's what made him worthy to, take this, to open the scroll. You see, the, the book of Revelation, as perplexing as it is, as startling as the image is, are in the book of Revelation. It's about a love story. It's about the bridegroom coming for his bride. Jesus is coming back for love. Yes, he's coming to judge the earth. Yes, he's coming to deal with the devil and his angels. Yes, he's coming to judge every one of us. But his motivation is not judgment. His motivation is love. He's coming back for love. He's coming back for a bride. Hallelujah. Don't you want to be ready when he comes? <laughs> Holy one. Yes, as you read earlier on. Dressed in fine linens. A bride was also quoted. A bride who was spotless without any wrinkle or blemish. You know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, earlier on when I read out of Jude. God did not lower his standard. His standard is perfection. It always has been and it always will be. And the only way we can become, stand before God blameless is by receiving His supply, by being, being clothed in His righteousness. God's standard is perfection, but amazingly, He's provided perfection for us. We have to be clothed in His perfection. We have to be clothed in His righteousness so that we can stand in His presence. Jesus. 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 He's coming back for a bride pure and spotless and holy, set apart. A bride who has made herself ready. 
That's the challenge for us. Yes, He has sent the Holy Spirit to instruct us, to empower us, to enable us, to, to be ready or to get ready. But, but it's still our choice. It's still our decision. We need to make ourselves ready and invite the Holy Spirit to work in us so that we can really be ready for when He comes. Whew. Holy One. Holy One. Holy One. When uh, I mentioned this, that the communion meal is specifically a celebration and a rehearsal of this covenant relationship that we have with God. And whenever I take communion, I, if possible, I like to drink the cup in two sips. The first sip. And I, th and, and I, want, I think about it in these terms. Jesus himself pours out the cup and he comes and presents it before us. Will you be betrothed to me forever? Is what he says. Yes, Jesus. I will be betrothed to you. And I take the first sip. And then I drink the rest of the cup. The second sip. Yes, Lord. I remember that we are now in covenant. It's not the marriage yet that's coming. But we are in covenant. The marriage covenant relationship. The covenant relationship has started. We are in covenant with our maker, with our creator. And the day is coming when he returns. Oh, and I want to be ready when he returns. And so I drink. The second sip is the cup of remembrance. I remember that I am betrothed. There's a veil over my face because I'm promised. I'm promised to one. And he is promised to me. And I will not look on another. He's coming for us. He's coming for us. So the communion meal is that. Is, is, it, that so for me, that takes on a lot more uh, meaning to take communion. Every time we take communion, that's, that's really what's going on. We are rehearsing and reminding ourselves of this covenant relationship. Jesus. Jesus. Holy One. I want to give an invitation for anyone who is... Um, perhaps this is news to you, that you're in a covenant relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. Or perhaps you don't know the Lord yet, and you want to, you understand that he's paid the price, Jesus paid the price for you to come into this relationship. So I want to give an invitation. If I could invite us, everyone to stand for a moment. <laughs> I want to give an invitation. Perhaps you just want to rededicate yourself. Just, just settle it in your own heart. I am committed to this covenant relationship. Jesus, Jesus, I belong to you and you alone. I belong to you and you alone. I belong to you and you alone. Lord. I want to set my eyes on you, Jesus, and nobody else. Jesus, I want to set my eyes on you and you alone. I will not bow the knee to another. Jesus, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of all of my life. You're worthy of everything that is in, within my power to give you. I give it to you now. I give it to you now. Jesus, it all is for you, that I may live for you. That I may live for you, even if I have to die for you. It's okay, because I belong to you. Holy One, I pray, Father, that that longing for your return would grow in our hearts. That yearning, just as we read in the end of Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, come. We long for you to come. Would you increase that longing in our hearts? Lord, and we set ourselves apart. We say we belong to you, Jesus. We belong to you. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. 
If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.